everybody. Thanks for listening to the Adulting is Easy podcast, where we make adulting easier by making money and personal finance easier. This is your host, Lauren. And please take a second and follow this podcast or subscribe to it on YouTube. And this is being video recorded if you'd rather switch from audio to video and watch it there. I'm joined today by Lawrence Briggs, aka College Boy. He's a real estate investor and financial literacy nerd with style from New Orleans. He shares tips and tools to help you turn earned income from a nine to five job into passive income to achieve the lifestyle you desire. Thanks for joining me, Lawrence. Thank you for having me, Lauren. I'm so excited for this interview. Me too. Me too. (laughs) I do want to let everybody know that this episode is brought to you by Steadily Insurance. Steadily covers so many different kinds of properties, single family, multifamily, vacant restorations, apartment buildings, condos, and even manufactured homes, which here in Florida is pretty difficult to find. Get this. They also cover Airbnbs and VRBOs. If you rent property to others, support this podcast by clicking the link in the show notes and getting a quote. Our goal for today, as always, is to make adulting easier for listeners by discussing a personal finance topic, since managing money is a huge part of adulting. So today, Lawrence, you and I are going to talk about your journey from living in poverty to becoming a landlord. Uh, Can you start by telling us what it was like growing up in New Orleans, though? Oh, wow. So, um, you know, most people love New Orleans because of the, you know, glitz and glamour like of Mardi Gras and all of the conferences that are held there and, you know, different events. Um, but most people um, in certain areas of New Orleans live in poverty. And um, for me, I was raised by a single mother um, who worked pretty much almost three jobs. Um, her life afforded her a high school, um, up until ninth grade education, she pretty much had to drop out of high school and started to, uh, raise my siblings. I'm one of seven. I have six sisters. Yeah, I'm one of seven. I have six sisters and I'm the sixth of the seventh. So I guess I'm like a all around triple special person. (laughs) Um, but growing up in the projects and in poverty, I was surprised that I was in poverty. And what I always tell people about that is mindset is everything. And so what my mother did with me and my sisters is that she gave us exposure. So even though we were physically in poverty, living in the housing projects, she mentally had us outside of that. So I always tell people I was raised in the projects, but I wasn't raised to be project. I don't have a project mentality. I don't have a woe me mentality. I don't have a, this is going to be the end all and be all of my life. My mother always instilled, instilled in me when I was younger that I can do anything in life and that anything was possible. So um, of course there was crime um, around, there were drugs around, Um, You know, I remember, um, you know, hearing gunshots all throughout the night. Um, I remember, you know, witnessing all types of, you know, violent crimes, whether it was fights outside um, or or just other criminal activity. But what my mother did was as a janitor in hospitals, she took money from her income to put me into private school. So I did not attend the local housing projects, poverty-based schools. And unfortunately, you know, those schools um, usually have a low success rate with education. Um, And my mother, it was another opportunity for her to get my mind outside of my physical being, if that made sense. So I was one of the few children (laughs) and the housing projects that would get bust from poverty into the suburbs where I attended um, a from pretty much nursery nursery to kindergarten to primary edu- education. I was going to school with children who parents were doctors and lawyers, uh, business owners. And of course I received a great education um, unfortunately, there were not many people that looked like me. Um, I remember from pre-K to like sixth grade, I was like the only African American male, African American in the school. And so, um, you know, my mother, um, you know, told me that 
there may not be people that look like me, but they're not better than you and you're not better than them. So I'm glad that she also gave me um, an opportunity to be exposed to a diverse uh, environment. And one thing that stuck out to me was being around these children. Um, they had two parents. Um, they had a car, you know, besides me being having a private van service, we were on the bus. Um, and whenever I attended their parties, they were mostly at houses and suburbs. And as a child, uh, my mind associated living in a home as an ultimate better life. Um, and of course, we know that things can happen bad in suburbs and, and, and stuff of that nature. But my little mind told me, I have to get to that. I have to not be in this environment called the housing projects. And so that's what sparked my interest in wanting to be in real estate because I seen that quote unquote American dream of the you know nice house and the white picket fence. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much how my journey started of being a poverty kid um, who knew that, that that there were that there was more outside of my physical um, environment. So what an amazing story. Thank you for sharing that. Your mom is must be one of the strongest people I've ever heard of. And she's so smart and she loves you so much and she sacrificed so much. What an incredible story. How did you think that you were going to get then from the projects to one of those houses with the white picket fence? You know, achieving that American, quote unquote, American dream of home ownership. When you were younger, how did you think you were going to get from point A to point B? Um, so for me, I knew that it was kind of associated with education and I know now, you know, you don't have to, you know, you definitely don't have to go to college to be a landlord or, in, you know, be in real estate, but everything revolved around education. I felt like education was my escape. And so, um, my mother eventually moved us out of the projects, but we, you know, my mother was never a homeowner. She, we kind of, you know, rented apartments and houses and sometimes landlords were, you know, discriminate against her because she had kids and, you know, we, I knew that I didn't want to be that type of landlord. Like we've lived without lights, water, just because a landlord would tell my mother, well, well, you should be happy that I'm bringing to you because you're single with kids. And we know that's a violation of fair housing, but you know, my mom would tell us it's okay. I'll go buy a heater. It's okay. I'll buy a fan because I'm happy that this landlord is allowing to rent to me because I'm single with, no, with, with kids. So um, I knew that the education was going to be an escape for me. Unfortunately, I, I, I didn't know that I had any other talents. I was always this smart kid, <laughs> this nerd. And um, I fell in love with the game Monopoly. And when I started to self-teach myself financial literacy, I stumbled upon the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, and when I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I was like, oh, wow, like wealth is created through real estate. Like, how can I, how can I do that? Like, how can I achieve that? And I was like, okay, I, I, I knew I want to have some type of job to get money. And so I went to, I went to college and received my bachelor's degree. And, um, I knew that the education allowed me to get some type of income. And uh, I started working um, after I co after college, I started working in student housing. And I said, you know what? I can do this myself. I was, I was, you know, scared, you know, because I, I really thought that like a normal person like me really, 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 you know, could not achieve it. You know, I was like, you know, I was second guessing myself and downing myself. And I know as a human, most people do that. And so I was working in uh, student housing for two publicly traded student housing companies. And I was making, you know, investors millions of dollars. And I said, you know, I may not have the capital, but I have the brain, you know, I, 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 am a creative person. I know leasing and I know marketing. And um, in 2018, I took the uh, the leap of faith to purchase my first property, which was um, my first home. 
so you went from as a child as a child you saw homes as the symbol of success and and you knew you wanted that and it was this job out of school then that made you think i want more than just one home i want to also rent to other people and be a landlord and be a good landlord to others yes yes um because you know I always tell people you really can't just gain wealth through just a, a nine to five if you're not utilizing that money and, and putting it into something else. And so um, when I was working in student housing, I was like, well, not only can I like own my own home, but I can I can be a, I can be a landlord. You know, I can I can do this. And of course, there were different, you know, um, podcasts that I stumbled upon and just research of certain things. Um, and I was like, I can do this. And uh, I took that leap of faith and um, I never looked back. And it all s- stems on generational wealth. Um, I want to be able to pass down something um, to generations beyond me. And um, I, I do not fault um, or feel that my mother lacked at all because what she gave me is way beyond any trust fund left. She gave me faith. She gave me a hard work ethic. She gave me the art of being confident, of being fearless. And that is priceless. She gave me a why. And I always tell people, you know, I am not no longer in shame nor embarrassed of where I've where I've come from because. It has acted as a catalyst to where I'm going. It's the fuel. Um, So I know that with generational wealth, most millionaires are created through real estate. And it's not just really one property. So I said, if I want to take what my mother gave me because she gave me a place to stay. And like I said, she loved me unconditionally. If I can take the morals that she gave me and the wealth that I build to my next generation, then it will be a full circle moment. I and love I, that. And I know that I, I, I would have lived on, on earth and served my purpose. That's amazing. So when you bought your house in 2018, that's your primary residence, right? Can you tell us kind of what that cost, what the down payment was, and how of you course. saved for that? Okay. Yeah, of course. Uh, so in 20, um, I kind of started uh, looking um, at the beginning of 20, um, 2018. Um, I told myself I was not going to renew my lease. I didn't tell my apartment complex that, though. And so I was like, I'm not going to renew my lease. And I just started looking online at properties. And um, I was residing in the Austin area um, and it was starting to get expensive as far as like uh, apartments. <laughs> and um, I told my buddy of mine who became a realtor, I was like, I want to buy a house. And I was like, and I want to buy one under $100,000. And he was like, what are you trying to buy? Like a dog house <laughs> in Austin? Like, <laughs> where are you going to find <laughs> something even close. And so what we did is we started to, you know, go on the MLS and we started to to move the radius. And um, I found an area that's about 45 minutes outside of Austin. Um, it's the Fort Hood, Cypress Cove, Killeen area. Um, it's home to um, the uh, Fort Hood military base. So I always tell people um, I'm in a niche market as well. And um, that property, and again, if everyone is listening, it's just 2018 numbers. <laughs> that probably was on the market for about 150 days. Nothing was wrong with it. No, absolutely. It was turnkey ready. Um, I purchased that property for $68,000. Three bedroom, one bath, single family home with the garage, um, about a close to 1,100 square feet living space, um, about almost 10 or a little over 10,000 square foot of a yard. And I received a seller's seller's concession um, up to about 3% down, uh, down towards my closing costs. 
um, out of pocket with closing costs and down payment, I think it was roughly around six grand. Um, I was able to use the Freddie Mac Home Possible loan. So I only put down 3% um, because of my income. And so I was super excited because I was like, oh, wow, like I can get something for 3% down. And then the seller is giving me 3%. Um, and I, I, I took a leap of faith. I actually had um, cashed out of one of my little baby retirement funds because I'm like, it's making pennies on a dollar. Like, let me just go in. I feel like this house is for me. So I bought that house. I closed November. I closed on that house November 5th of 2018. So um, it's about to be four years. Um, this house is now worth $170,000 wow. in less than, yeah. So it doubled in, it doubled in value. What, um, so, what's uh, the payment? <laughs> what's the payment on that? Yeah. So right now the payment on the interest rate was 5.25%. Um, so I always tell people, you know, everyone was saying not to buy in 2018. They were saying houses were too expensive. They were like, I, there's no way I would pay $68,000 for that house. There's no way you should pay 5.25%. Um, all in with principal, interest, um, property taxes, and insurance. My payment is $622. What was your rent then when you were living in or really close to Austin? Uh, so I always tell people because I did leasing and marketing, I, I used to negotiate my rent and I never paid market. <laughs> I never paid market rent. Um, but I, I never, I, I think I'm, I'm never paid market rent. And I also keep my rent um, a little bit be below market rate, um, just to try to have some afford affordability. Um, so I had a one bedroom, 450 square feet, um, one bedroom apartment in North Austin that was in a very sketch area. The rent <laughs> on that it was very, very extremely <laughs> sketch. Um, the rent on that now it, water was allocated um, into it. It was seven fifty, but my okay. rent was going up to like nine ninety five. Wow. Okay. So <laughs> that's that's really that's fascinating. And I know that this was twenty eighteen. But there are some themes with you buying your first house that are still valid today. You can still put 3% down on your first primary home. You can still look 45 minutes to an hour outside of your core area and see if there are more affordable areas. And you can still ask for seller's concessions, especially now, actually, that the it's more of a buyer's market than a seller's market like it's been the last few years. So I want people to take those themes away. And that was a similar thing when I bought my first house. I think the rent I was looking at for an apartment was like 800 bucks. And then I ran the mat, ran the numbers and the payment on a house, which was much bigger where I could get a roommate was like 725. So, you know, that that can be done. And I think some of those things can still be done now. Do you still live there or did you move to another one and then rent that one out? No, I'm still here. This, this is where I'm at right now in my home, in my home office. Um, my original goal, um, because I'm single with no kids right now, um, was to just own and occupy a house every year and move. I was like, I'm yep. just going to do that. Yep. And um, so again, my timeline, you know, I closed November of 2018. So within less than 60 days, we're in 2019. So my goal was at the end of 2019 to go in 2020, move out <laughs> and buy another one. But we all yeah. know what happened towards the end of 2019. Yeah. And I was like, wait, so the property that I bought in 2018 was 68, but now it's at the lowest 150. Like, ah! and um, I started to run the numbers and it was better for me to hold this because I have, I, I'm able to have like an equity piggy bank. So it was better for me to stay in this current property with a, a great equity piggy bank that I can use and deploy for other deals and just um, buy investment properties um, without owner, owner, without owner occupying until it makes sense on um, financially. 
Got it. So are you doing that through a home equity line of credit, second mortgage, cash out refi? What did you do? So, um, so I recently uh, purchased two rental properties um, within six months. One was February of 2022 and one was um, end of uh, July of 2022. Um, so the first one, I was all in with my own money. Um, doing 2020, which we know what happened, um, I was working a, um, a side job. I was doing food delivery. And I did that after work and I did that on weekends. And within a year part time, I had saved up close to twenty thousand dollars. Wow! Doing that, yeah. So you know, I always tell people I worked. You know, you you when you have a strong why, you'll get out and do it. Uh, I'm talking literally getting off work. You know, at five six o'clock work until nine ten eleven, doing sixteen hours on weekends from like seven a.m. to like eight p.m. Um, wow. So I ended, I know, so I ended 2020 with about 20 grand of of doing food deliveries of disposable um, income, you know, just extra income. And so I was like, okay, well, I don't want my money just sitting in the bank. I should just get a uh, a rental property. And so what I did was um, I fell into an opportunity that I bought a two bedroom, one bath property in February um, with 15 percent down. Not on the occupied single family home. Um, I was all in with down payment and closing costs around sixteen grand. Wow, um, nice. So that yeah, it was very very nice. And so oh, I was like, okay, great. I know it, it very was. I'm like, okay, one property a year. That's great. Well, that was February. Fast forward to around July um, through networking, which is very important as an investor. Um, I yeah. fell into another opportunity. Uh, where an investor was deloading um, properties and um, the numbers work. And um, I always tell people everyone's risk tolerance is different. You know, everyone's risk level True. is different. And, you know, a unpopular opinion is that personal finance is personal to the person. So this deal came around and I was like, okay, well, I, I I have the money, you know, I can, you know, do that, but I want a higher cash reserves. How about I get creative with the down payment and closing costs? And so I was able to um, open up a HELOC on my current um, property. And because I'm such a um, a, a cautious buyer uh, or a cautious person with funds, um, I only did like a 65 loan the ratio on that because sure. I, I want to keep yeah keep um and so yeah so I got a key lock on my um on my primary residence to be able to buy the second um rental property. So in total uh three properties, one primary and two rentals. Amazing. So that first one, the one where you save the down payment money by side hustling doing food delivery for an entire year, how much was that one and how much is it rent for? Yeah, so um, that one was sixty five thousand. Um, it's a two bedroom, one bath, um, and I was able to get it off market under value. So I was able to get, I was able to do the deal um, about fifteen grand lower than what it appraised that. So it was, wow. it was heavily, yeah, it was heavily. And you put sixteen in. You said the down payment and closing costs were sixteen thousand, and it appraised for fifteen thousand more than you paid for it. So you were yeah. into the deal like one thousand dollars almost, basically. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's great. And it was and it was turnkey. And I always tell people it's through network, you know, um, um, and, and just having a, a a very likable character or just having a moral character. And um, so that's a two bedroom, one bath. Um, purchased it for sixty five. It appraised about fifteen over um the at the sales price. Um, that one rents for eight seventy five okay. a month. And, the, and so the payment on that is that similar to your other one around six hundred seven hundred bucks? So no, actually, I I that one was that one is like I'd say that one was like a gym because <laughs> I was it, it was like it was it was turnkey. But we so we closed February of 2022, but we went in the contract December of 2021. 
It's ah. my property with my best interest rate. I got four. I see. Wow. Four percent yeah. interest rate. Yeah. Yeah. The, so the 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 PD on that is four hundred and twenty one dollars. Amazing. That's so great. Ah, and I self, I self man. Thank you. I self managed, so I cash flow over three hundred dollars. That's awesome. That's great. And what about the third one then? The third property, the second rental. What was the, yeah. how much did that, how much did you pay for that? How much is the rent and how much is the cash flow? Okay. So I paid um, right under 100 uh, for that. I paid 90 for that. Okay. Um, so I paid 90 grand for that. That one is a three bedroom, one bath, single family home. Um, the interest rate was higher because we went under contract in July of this year of 2022. So the interest mm-hmm. rate on that one is similar to my primary. It's around, well, it's a, a it's a, a point higher. Um, that interest rate is around 6%, I want to say. It's like 6 point, I want to say 6.125%. And let me just take a look at the, yeah, the interest rate is 6.125%. And my PD on that, so principal, interest, mortgage, and insurance is 665. Okay. And, it for, and what's the it rents for eleven ninety five? So, wow, great. Um, yeah, so definitely not a not such a high cash flow as the other one, but it works. So if I was to refinance down the down the line, it's going to be um, a, a even home better home run, and that one appraised over what I paid for it as well. Jeez. Okay. So, <laughs> and I, this is great. Okay, because I want people to think about. But just even just taking those two properties into account, one is a 4% interest rate, one is a 6% interest rate, and they both still work. And I think that's key. I think a lot of people think high interest rate, no go. But I like that you haven't, that hasn't been your approach at all. It, it's not my approach. And a lot of people understand, like I always tell people, you know, I'm going to buy real estate regardless if the numbers work. Like it's, it's monopoly. You have to get on the board game. You have yeah. to, you have to get in the game because- the second rental property was a home run for a different reason. Because we all know where interest rates are now. Yeah. So I got in at six percent versus I think I people I've been quoted around eight to nine, nine to ten. Yeah. Yeah. But that property appraised forty thousand dollars over what I paid for it because I had a motivated seller. And I was in for that property at 18000 So I, I walked away like free. Yeah. And that's the thing, too, that I think is people may not understand about higher interest rates is there's lower competition in the in, for buyers. So you're going to get houses maybe for a lower price than you would have six months ago, certainly with less interest in it, right? Exactly. And I think people have to look at a deal holistically. I think yeah. people always want to a la carte a deal. Or if it doesn't just, you know, I'm serious. If they do, they want to a la carte a deal. They're like, oh, well, I really want just this. Or I really just want that. And it's right. like investors know it's not just an a la carte thing. It's it's looking at if a, a full course meal. Like, how can this thing make me full in so many different ways? Like, it's quenching my thirst. It, it's, 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 you know, it's. Doing something else for me, it's it's feeling a craving. And so for me, had I waited, literally, you know, months apart, you know, the deal would have still worked, but it would have just been less of a full course meal. You know, it would have been a little bit watered down. And I tell people, you have to network because I did both of my rentals off market beating out cash buyers. Through networking. So we see this online a lot. Mm-hmm. And you've been on the renting side of things and on the landlord side of things. Yes. Is our landlords evil? No. And I, this is something that I want people to be more educated on. Unfortunately, you know, some people may have endured bad landlords, but that's not the end all of be all. Like you can, that's just like going to a restaurant. Like just because you didn't like a waiter at X restaurant doesn't mean all waiters are horrible. 
Uh, it could be with any anything in America, anything where, even outside of America, anything where it's a human being being physically involved. You're probably not going to like something, but that doesn't mean that they are the end all and be all. For me, I like the fact that in the world we are able to have landlords because think about the beauty of living in America to be able to pick and choose. Like if you want, you know, to live in an apartment, a high rise, if you want to live in a cottage, you know, if if there are no landlords, then you know. Society will be structured where everyone lives in a project because I always say the projects is what it, it is. It's a project. You literally put a community of people, you throw people into a community and let them fend for themselves. You know, there's no financial yeah. literacy in the projects. So I feel like, what do you want when you think a landlord is evil? And question yourself, why is a landlord evil? Have you ever tried to put your shoes in Put yourself in in the shoes of a landlord. People don't understand that at the end of the day, you're providing a service. You can't go to a restaurant, order whatever you want, and eat and walk out and not pay. You know, I think the biggest common denominator of of why people say landlords are so evil is because they don't see that. themselves they don't what i think a lot of people don't understand is that they see landlords as evil because they don't feel as though they can achieve ownership yeah it's right and this to, other person did right there it's this it's this thing where that person has something that i don't have I don't have a strong why, or I don't think that I can do that. Therefore, I don't like that person. I, I always just wonder, haven't we all at some point rented? And weren't we glad there was a place to rent? And do we begrudge the person for making a bit of money, not a ton, but a bit of money for the hard work that it takes to find that property, save the money, buy that property and upkeep that property? Mm-hmm. And... That's what's interesting to me, because if there weren't private people doing it, then like you said, it would be the government and that would be the only place you would either own or you'd be in government provided housing if there weren't landlords. And I no, I definitely agree. And another thought that came by when came to mind when you were speaking a great input is that landlords or too humanized. And, 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 and this is my example. When you go buy a car and you don't get upset with whatever manufacturer or, or, or conglomerate, you're paying a car note every month. You don't get upset about that. You may be leasing a phone every month. You don't get upset by said company, you know, but because you know another human being is most likely getting some type of funds, you're upset. And I've seen this more when it's a not a big company. Um, unfortunately, our recent experiences on social media where someone you know told me that I'm taking up houses from other people because I'm a human being and I decided to work two jobs to buy properties to, uh, to provide housing to people be a good landlord and have affordable rents. I was a bad person because I took houses from other people that could have went and did the same thing as me because they attach, oh, this is a physical person. He or she is obtaining something that I didn't even try or even think that I can do. But when it's, and I'm not going to say names because it's not sponsored for other people, but when it's institutional buyers that come and drop on the park, apartment complex, you rent, you don't care. Or when it's, yeah. you know, an institutional buyer that owns tons of, you know, duplexes or single family homes, you're not thinking, oh, landlords are so evil until you start to attach, oh, there's a human behind that. And that human is gaining money. And it's like, but you're getting, you're getting something in return. And I think that's, that's the hard part about it. People don't argue with their phone company when they buy a phone or release a phone or pay a phone bill, they don't argue with their car note or whatever. It's just, yeah. and it's far 
because as a as a human being, because I'm human first, it, it does make me um it, it can bother you and make you feel like, well, why would this person think that I'm so mean and evil because I'm providing someone a place to stay in return at not return in exchange. It's a transaction. Um and I think that That's... they have to remember that that is transactional. I'm not well, unfortunately I'm not it's not like I'm running a charity now. Will I use as I build wealth, create charities and scholarships? There's so much stuff. I want to go back into into the projects and try to, you know, have financial literacy programs and camps yeah. that will afford yeah. me that. But at the end of the day, it's a business. It's transactional. That's so well said, and it's a good point. And I've never thought about it that way. I've never compared paying a phone bill or paying your car note to paying rent. And when, you know, they actually just, they can just put a face, they know who the person is. They know the person's name, who's getting that check. So I think you're right. I think that is really impactful. What are some qualities of a good landlord? You have to care about people. Um, You have to, because it's transactional. Um, I think you first have to care. Um, because it is a person, no matter if you own a thousand units or one door, it, it, it's someone on the other end that, you know, maybe their only hope to get that apartment in their house to change their life. So, <clears throat> excuse me, you have to first care. Um, the next thing is you have to be firm. <laughs> You yeah. have to be able to stand um, stand firm in your policies and procedures. Yeah. You can't be fluid with that. Uh, and if you are a person who don't think that you're capable of doing it, then you shouldn't self-manage. I'm not saying don't buy, but that's where prof- other professionals would come in. Yeah. But you have to yeah. care first about people. Um, second. You have to be firm, stand firm um, in your policies and procedures. And then the third thing I would say is organization. You have to be organized because uh, not being organized um, will backfire on you. Not being organized is not dotting every I and crossing every T on a lease agreement and a tenant using yeah. that lease against you to get out of yeah. it. You know, not being organized is, you know, not having receipts for certain things for your CPA or when it's tax time, yep. you know, yep. not being organized is not responding to a maintenance request. So I would say yeah. care about people, stand firm in your policy procedures and be organized. I love it. Lawrence, is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap it up? I would like to tell people. Do not be afraid to go and buy real estate. I know as a human, we have fear, but that means that you have a pulse. You are a human. It's what you do with that fear. Is will you let the fear push you and say, you know what, I'm going to go and try to take a chance and see what's on the other side of fear or Will you just go hide in the blanket and just have the shoulda, coulda, woulda, or unfortunately be negative towards other people who are achieving things that you want to achieve? Go out and buy real estate because your future self will be happy for it. The generations beyond you will be happy for it. And that can look anywhere from just having one property to many properties. Time in the game matters. Get in the game, run your numbers, educate yourself, build the equity, and you will be happy that you did. I almost just want to end it there, but I do want to ask, how can people get in touch with you? Of course. So I am on social media. It's Lawrence with the W underscore Briggs. So L E W R E N C E underscore Briggs, B R I G G S, or just Google me, Lawrence Briggs. I always have some type of picture with a bow tie and that's going to be me. (laughs) I do love the bow tie. 
Uh, you guys can find me on Twitter at Adulting is Easy. As I mentioned, I started a YouTube channel. Please follow that. Also, if you want to check out these videos, we also have some clips from this conversation that you can watch uh, if you'd rather do that. You can email me at realadultingiseasy at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, everybody. I truly mean that. And I hope Lawrence and I have made it adulting a little easier for you.